So this lecture is titled Architecture, Identity, and the Malaysian Society Interpreting Democracy and Multiculturalism. Now in this lecture, I am going to outline my idea of a new architecture for Malaysia using the values of democracy and multiculturalism as the bedrock and anchor towards the formation of new form of architecture. Now this idea is to challenge the present approaches by architects that uses object-centered discourse, whereas mine is called a value-centered discourse on architecture. If you are to look at these two buildings, one the administrative architecture in Putrajaya and the other in our housing, there is a distinct identity of architecture, whether we want it or not. Now, some Malaysians will feel that the identity of the Perdana Putra or the Prime Minister office in Putrajaya is not our identity or should not be our identity, as well as the housing or the flats that is shown again should not be part of our identity. Nevertheless, in the present, they are. And how do we prevent such, archi such architecture to come into place uh, requires a fundamental shift in our thinking that not only about what Malaysia is, what Malaysians are, or who Malaysians are, and the ensuing architecture from that, rather than purely an architectural discourse of object-centered uh, issues. Now, my main message can be summed up in this short sentence, which is a meaningful national architectural identity can only come about from the interpretation of the country's value system brought out by the political ideology and cultural adaptation of all races. So the key difference in my discourse is political ideology and cultural adaptation of all races, being the human values or community values that will spark a new architecture for Malaysia rather than what is termed as an identity architecture. I do not like the term identity, uh, but because the discourse has been set in that terminology, thus I have to use it at the moment. But I will explain why I do not feel comfortable using this term. An example of a value-centered discourse is by Frank Lloyd Wright in his defi definition of American democratic architecture, he says that a democratic building is at ease, it stands relaxed. Being at ease and relaxed are the same. A democratic building again is for and belongs to the people. That's the second aspect. It is of human scale for men and women to live in and feel at home. So, number one, it stands relaxed, not formalistic. Number two, belongs to the people. How the various different cultures of the people can feel that something belongs to them is an important concern. And finally, it's about feeling at home and the idea of human scale, meaning being part of rather than um, being out of or against this kind of uh, architecture. Now in this slide, there are two student projects and two buildings of our past history in Malaysia. Number one, we can notice the parliament building and number two, the one on the bottom is the Dewan Jubilee Intan in Johor. Both were built in the 60s. The Dewan Jubilee Intan is earlier than the parliament building. Now, 
the other two sketches are from the students uh, two mosques and this is how i want to take the audience or the uh, uh, listeners uh, to my idea of architecture this is the direction and how i will dismantle the present thoughts of uh, architecture approaches and how i will build a new framework in order to reach this kind of architecture that is posed on the slide now remember these are just forms that is interpreted from values do not hold on to the form but understand the form from the values now the structure of this presentation is divided into five parts first is the questioning the need of identity secondly the idea of architecture and morality thirdly interpreting the rukunagara in contemporary politics to identify the values of being a malaysia fourth is the aspect of values from rukunagara which is multiculturalism and how it is interpreted in architecture and lastly how the idea of democracy uh, is interpreted in architecture and democracy being also the values of malaysia Now the first question is about identity. As I said, I feel very uncomfortable using this term identity simply because architecture is first and foremost a product of people's culture, values and idealism. Now identity is only necessary or it's uh, only workable if it is natural and not forced or manufactured. The idea of identity is something that is a product of rather than an objective to be achieved. So the best approach is not something revivalistic because it has a form for you to actually manifest. But it is reinterpretive within a critical and meaningful manner of the problems and issues that arises. So the three anchors of Malaysian architectural identity is something about multiculturalism and democracy. And of course, Islam is something that is an extra aspect, but I will not be discussing this in this lecture, but in another lecture by itself. Now, first and foremost, why I am com I'm comfortable with the term identity is because to search for an identity is a false purpose of life because it forms a mental image of the thing and then one goes towards that image and it's simply an image what is true in life is simply to find what is our true purpose and therefore to fulfill those purposes and that would be the real objective of life rather than seeking a personal identity and this is something which is not true uh, to even per person um, objects as well as buildings identity is actually identified by others on oneself not projected by the person to the other uh, if we were to look at say for instance a person uh, like me, for instance, I have been given an, an identity of a person who has a very open-minded view of things and very courageous in talking and criticizing um, the politics of the, the day. And so that is an identity given to me. I do not seek it and I do not want it or I do not uh, even prefer it. But it is an identity given or there are some malays who feel that i am a person who is too liberal with my interpretation of islam and too critical of my interpretation of malay actions i did not set out to do that i merely tackle the issues at hand uh, within the framework that i saw fit but i was given an identity of being a uh, liberal Muslim as well as a critical 
uh, a Malay who is disloyal to his own race. So that is an identity that I did not want, but then it is given. So identity is actually given by by others. Now, if you were uh, somebody like Michael Jackson, um, an identity can be manufactured for you in order to sell videos as well as an image. The image of Michael Jackson as a as a a good gangster being portrayed in the uh, song thriller as well as bad um, is something that is manufactured in order to sell the song as well as the attire or style of wearing clothes. Now I have classified three kinds of identity in architecture that has been used in Malaysia. One is natural identity, second is false identity, and third is manufactured identity. Now natural identity is something that answers what certain scholars call the spirit of times and the spirit of place. What is the spirit of time? Well, the spirit of time means that the object, whether it is a, um, a cooking pot or a, or a glass, a drinking glass, is about the state of the arts technology. Several hundred years ago, we can find porcelains of vessels for us to drink. But now, those vessels are different because different technology, different material, different times. The spirit of place is about the context of the space or the place or the geography of that particular position or place, which is something to do with the climate, with the landscape, with the earth that contains the available material. So if we were to look at a two buildings, a building in Egypt, um, traditional architecture would be of mud construction because that is the state of the art technology. And it has the spirit of place because it does not have too many windows and as well as the material is built from special mud that can only be available there. In Malaysia, we have timber. And the architecture then is of timber construction because that is the material that is available in abundance and the technology of putting timber together is there. And so we can see the bridge that is designed by Santiago Calatrava also present the spirit of times where steel is able to do this kind of cantilever architecture that is not possible in the traditional architecture of the past. Now, when some people ask me whether Malaysia has an architectural identity, I answer yes. Because when you go anywhere in Malaysia, you will see something like this picture, which is the housing estate. 50 years ago, if you travel around Malaysia, you will not see this. But now, they are everywhere. Whether we like it, whether we want it or not, it is not our choice. It is the, the developer economics that develop this kind of architecture for us to buy and live in. And so this is forced upon us. And this is an identity. But whether we like it or not, or we like a different version of it, it's up to us. This kind of identity is manufactured by Tone Dr. Mahathir, who wants to project himself as a powerful Muslim leader in the world as well as in Malaysia. Tone Dr. Mahathir produced or manufactured this identity in order to fight off the influence of party Islam in Malaysia and the rising tide of Islamic reformation. And so he projects the Barisan National or AMNO as the um, warrior of Islam as well as sending a message, 
about the prime minister office being the most powerful office that is stronger and more powerful than the sultans now even though Don Dr Mahathir is just a prime minister who is an elected representative of the people he is in fact a servant of the people but he projects the image of an emperor and this is the political and manufactured identity that he wanted in the architecture scene architects have several approaches to identity most malay architects prefer to use traditional malay revivalism why because politically they themselves understand that malaysia is based on a malay historical heritage although there is sarawak and sabah which is not malay but it is ignored in the wider perspective of what malaysia is or we could say this is peninsula politics and so the populist approach of taking a house or traditional malay house and 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 blowing it up into a bigger proportion is a populist approach that is understood by many people some critics find this as regressive because it shows a society malay society that cannot think beyond its past as well as it's a regressive and and has no meaning because the concrete is made to look like timber as well as the glass curtain wall again to be made to look like the janda berhias uh, timber panel of old another method or approach that is used by malay architects is the metaphor the use of the uh, pucuk rebung by architect hijaz kasturi in the telecom tower attest to the idea of malayness via an object uh, that is in the psyche of the malay culture again the idea of the kris in the maybank building is uh, related to the malay society as the dominant race in malaysian politics the idea of the tabung haji which looks like in one sense the uh, uh, the the traditional uh, tabung or place to keep money which is made from bamboo although the intention of hijaz was not there in the tabung haji and the maybank building to actually use metaphor but he had agreed to the interpretations by people in relation to it being a metaphor for kris and the tabung then we have the uh, uh balas ni lukis or the or the or the national uh art building which is based on the uh, metaphor of the um sirih junjung uh, which is an object that is carried Uh, in a ceremony uh, related to marriage in a malay society and one criticism of this kind of national building is that it again carries a single ethnic reference non malay architects like ling chong kiet and uh, dr ken yang uh, prefers to use the approach of machine originalism under the tradition of mis or kabuzie and they do not want it to be ethnocentric but only use the idea of climate as the uh, basis for forming the building so the machine niaga is a building that is a product of how it deals with the tropical climate similarly also that of the material and the building um, sun shading devices of the university of malaya lecture hall mm-hmm. 
Then there are architects like Jimmy Lim who prefers to choose traditional material rather than the traditional form of the house. Now, Lim believe in the use of traditional material giving the spirit of what is called identity and we can see it from the Salinger house and also another architect who designed the Thailand Rawi using timber and stone. These are both natural material from this country carrying the spirit of place. But frame within the modern construction of spirit of time. So there is no ethnocentric reference and it is also something that is quite timeless. However, it lacks the possibility of creating a high rise in this kind of approach, which is the primitive regionalism approach. Dan mereka-mereka ini juga mengatakan bahawa menggunakan bahan-bahan ini mengingatkan kita kepada kemeseraan kita dengan alam sekitar dan mengingatkan kita kepada spiritualiti ketuhanan. Sebab bangunan dia bangunan berskala yang tidak besar. Contohnya dekat hotel di Nantawi. Apa kata kalau kita buat bangunan pentadbiran rupa macam ini? Tidakkah itu menunjukkan kemasraan uh, pemimpin dengan rakyat dan alam sekitar menunjukkan bahawa pemimpin pun uh, menghormati alam sekitar. Tapi kita biarkan pemimpin membina rumah yang besar, bangunan yang besar dengan lanskap yang telah dirasakan dan sebagainya itu menunjukkan bahawa mereka tidak mempunyai kemasraan kepada alam sekitar. Dan mereka menjadi pemimpin yang membuat polisi besar alam sekitar. Bagaimana kita nak mengharapkan generasi masa depan anak-anak kita boleh bernafas atau tak boleh bernafas? Okay. So, uh, jadi... In summary, all the buildings that has been described follows what I call an object-centered approach. Whether they follow an object like traditional Malay house or they follow an object like the Siri Junjong or they follow an object such as uh, um, the idea of uh, uh, catering only to the climate. Now, the object-centered approach is restrictive and cannot progress beyond the discourse of socio-politics of the nation. There is no talk about being multicultural or the idea of democracy. Now, this part of lecture looks at values of morality and architecture design. If you look at the statement by Pugin, no features about the building which are not necessary for convenience, construction or propriety, we can ask why the mosque of the Shah Alam Mosque carries on four minarets when one will be enough or even no mineral is necessary. If we understand Islam as not liking waste stage and Islamic history of the Azan, we know that the Azan is only about telling the time of prayer. And so, technically, you do not need any of the minaret at all because everybody can tell when is the time for prayers. So, the Shah Alam Mosque unnecessarily follows a revivalistic architecture. Similarly with the Bang Bumi Putra building, making the building look like a house again, making the concrete look like timber again. Is this necessary? This is no morality because it is steep in falsehood. Another quote of Eugene is about construction and how uh, the spirit of times uh, will give the necessary identity of the building. We look at the Mannheim Thai Theater, we can see how the structure uh, work with the ceiling be hung from the girders and how this creates 
a volume of space for air conditioning that is less if the ceiling were put above or on top of the girders. We can also see clearly the columns supporting it and we can see that there are no columns inside. So the building is very clearly a product of construction, economics, and that becomes its own identity and has a beauty and truthfulness or sincerity by itself. Pugin again said that different architecture in different places can be or can have different forms or language of architecture due to the technology available at that place as well as the material that is there. He postulated that a church is a church, but it can have different forms, but it follows a single value about its ritual and direction, and uh, but the form itself, in terms of its uh, material and the massing and the shape of the building, would follow the technology of the specific places. So here is the first inclination of the idea of regionalism. Finally, we have the uh, quote by Violet Ledoux saying that good architecture is the immediate expression of a requirement of that particular time. Look at the two buildings. The mosque on the left is the Federal Territory Mosque. Uh, it does not answer the expression of requirement of the time. It follows a typology of mosque building in Turkey several hundred years ago, regardless of whatever immediate expression of the requirement of the time. The other picture is a sketch of a building of a mosque in which it expresses the idea of the mosque being a community center, place to eat, to meet, to gather, to come and uh, socialize rather than just prayer alone. And the form it takes is a modern form answering whatever function that the building caters to rather than a, a specific idea of form in history to be copied, imitated and revived. Now I come now to the next section of the talk which is how do I develop the new basis of architecture for Malaysia. And I have chosen to develop it from the understanding of the values of what being Malaysia is all about. And I have used the Rukun Negara as the basis for my discourse. The Rukun Negara has five principles, belief in God, loyalty to king and country, supremacy of the constitution, rule of law, and courtesy and morality. Now, how can these words that is supposed to be uh, placed upon the shoulders of the citizenry can be converted into architecture. And this is what I call the value-centered discourse rather than objects. So after understanding the issues and problems with the approach in a national architecture, I will now explain how I have reconstructed the idea of an architecture appropriate for Malaysia. First of all, the values of multiculturalism is embedded in two of the principles or principles of Rukunagara, that is belief in God and courtesy and morality. To be a Malaysian, we must accept all religion, not just tolerate. We must respect all rituals and tradition and uh, be very careful in commenting on each other's rituals and tradition. And even in fact, sometimes we can participate uh, in the interest of neighborly friendliness and aspects like that. For instance, the, the festivals, we can participate and uh, for the interest of being Malaysian. Although there are some religious scholars who say that Muslims cannot do this, I disagree with them because they are not talking about the nation, they are simply talking about their religious books that have no concept of nation building. We can also emphasize certain values that we share. Although again, religious scholars uh, in this country 
do not like that because then it says you are acknowledging the truthfulness of other religion whereas only one religion is true and others are false i disagree with that again because if we have universal values it shows we have a common root and a common concern courtesy and morality is about communicating good behavior uh, before we go into someone's house we give salam or we greet and this are all actions and rituals and values that can be converted into architecture my own definition of being a malaysian is that a malaysian is one who is proud of his or her own race religion and ethnic culture but also views other races with a different religion and culture as a necessary and critical part of their social economic and spiritual life now as a malay i'm proud of being a malay a muslim and about my heritage and culture but i also view the chinese the indian the kadazan the murut as necessary and critical part of my social economic and spiritual life for instance i may have a friend who is a non muslim non malay and this friend may be able to help me or may even give me some uh, counsel or solace in my life's travels i may even work with someone uh, who is not of a different race uh, who is someone from a different race and actually i do where the owner of the university that i work for is not from my own race or not from my own religion and i also help other people who are not of my own race who needs money who needs help uh, to survive and again uh, this is something which is necessary for our spiritual life because if we do not know anyone from our own race and religion to help then we need to help others uh, that is not from our race and religion so we need all people in our social economic and spiritual life we cannot say that we can live in isolation but that is what happens in malaysia we live in isolation already 60 years that we are independent but we all live in isolation we isolate ourselves not only in our housing we isolate ourselves in our work for instance most malays are civil servants and non malays are not civil servants so that there is a big divide there and we also isolate ourselves in understanding one another we say that understanding one another is wrong from the religious perspective and we isolate ourselves again in history we say that this race is to be blamed for such thing as may that in when in fact the blame should be shouldered by all and so this is the way that we are destroying ourselves and if we can have a shared history a shared economic idea and a shared uh, value system um, to manage our life we would be a better nation thus values of multiculturalism in architecture uh, can be interpreted in this manner number 1 we have universal values we are all concerned about safety for our children safety against crime um the need of the old this is regardless of culture every culture grows old every culture have children every culture is afraid of crime then we also have specific values like privacy worship celebration these are these are different so we need to celebrate the things that we are universal and we need to understand and deal with things that are um special thus basic universal values of safety uh, can be seen in how we have di- uh, di- uh, design our cities uh, to be traps for children difficult for old people and okay use and uh, we have a, a a community housing that kills social life and make it a criminal paradise 
and we also do not understand how to make our house housing cooler without the air conditioning. This is an example of how we design our housing. We have a corridor that is made to lead to each unit. But I always ask the question, why do you design the house with this kind of corridor, similar to a hotel with the same kind of corridor, and an office building that has also the same kind of corridor? Isn't the, 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 the hotel and the office different than the house in terms of having children? Isn't it different in the sense that in a hotel, you only stay for three or four days, and therefore you do not need to put up a flower pot or a, or, a, or a place to call your serambi. Isn't it also the same as in a hotel where you only work there for eight hours and then go home? You don't own it and therefore you do not uh, territorialize the place. And that is why children fall because they climb over pots and fall over the, bell, uh, over the railing. And this is blamed on negligence, which is wrong. It is supposed to be the fault of the architect for not understanding that having children requires a different design than designing a hotel or an office building. There are many examples of how to make it safer for children, an extended floor slab for planters, for drying clothes, or the idea of Moshe Safde uh, designing the habitat housing so that even though it's eight floors and you can fall from the eighth floor onto the seventh floor rather than all the way to the bottom. If we look at the idea of uh, crime, we, we have this kind of architecture where the planners reserve the back alley and don't use it. Once upon a time, the back alley is useful for other purpose, like collecting the uh, feces, but now it is used only as a fire break. And this back alley is not used, therefore it becomes a criminal paradise. I always say that either you have to fully use the back alley as a social function place or you have to lose it, meaning no back alleys and have a common uh, party wall uh, between the, the building. If we look at the student design, there is no back alley. So there is no problem of crimes being uh, perpetrated in the lonely uh, back doors and back windows. Anyone who comes into this space will ident immediately be identified as a threat by the inhabitants because he has come into a territory that is common to all and the owners of all the houses feel a sense of ownership rather than a sense of isolation. With regard to climate, uh, the link houses or the terrace houses comes from the shop houses of old. Now the shop houses keep self cool before the idea of the aircon or electricity by having several air wells. However, we took the terrace house and eliminated the air wells. And so the houses become ovens. Now the way to handle this, they are and it is also understood, but we ignore them. This is the characteristic of the tropical house, a modern tropical house, the JKR Polis Barrack, even though it's of structure of concrete and masonry. But the walls uh, of uh, uh, partition uh, in the unit are all timber. And timber has a, a low uh, absorption of heat and also the walls are filled with louvers and uh, openings and the wind can flow in through those, this unit. I have the privilege of living in this barrack for six years in my childhood and I don't remember feeling overly hot like what we feel now in the low-cost flats or the housing by JKR that does not have this character. To me, this is the best example of a machine, a habite, or the house as a machine for living in, because it is an excellent example of tropical architecture. Our terrace housing is designed as a complete unit, 
but we do not cater for family expansion. And this forces family to leave the community as well as cost the family a lot of financial burden. If we are to understand this natural phenomenon of family expanding and design a housing that can expand uh, with the expansion of the family, like what happens in the Malay houses, where it becomes uh, larger in terms of having different more units, and then we can have a specific identity. This is a expandable housing created by one of the students that can go 200%, meaning that it can start on a single floor and expand to two other floors and also can reverse by uh, having the expansion uh, reduced. The idea here is that as the family grows, so does the house. And then when the family shrinks because the children have already left, then the owners can either uh, sell the third floor uh, in terms of its um, parts, like the parts of a car. You could uh, sell it to another another owner who needs this. And so this kind of architecture has a certain character to it. Now, if we can understand the basic cultural values, then we can design appropriate housing and cities. But here we, as architects, do not understand the cultural values of the people, as well as the modern lifestyle that has come to us within this traditional construct. A clear example is about some privacy violations where in the uh, corridor of the uh, flats of housing in order to get from one place to another place or uh, to get to your unit you will always have to pass one other person's unit and uh, the corridor is designed that uh, we can actually see inside the building even though we are using translucent um, louvered windows or glass but uh, it is supposed to be kept open and uh, certain things like sound voices couples arguing can be heard and that is a privacy violation. This is the idea of non-conformity and therefore should not be the character of the housing in Malaysia. If we can design for it, then we have a character of a housing for Malaysia. Now, this plan by the students um, who had taken the uh, floor plans and the build-up area of the low-cost flat and redesigned it, have shown some ingenuity in terms of cultural preference. For instance, the use of the stair landing as a social activity center, uh, where in other flats, stair landing are just that, they are stair landing as well as a, a place for people to get into their houses or to their units. But here, um, children can play uh, in this stair landing because it is widened. And also, uh, Sarambi can be placed outside of the unit as well as the idea of overflow space and social gathering space. There is also a back entrance to each of the unit uh, because in a, uh, in a in a Muslim culture uh, women uh, cannot cross over from uh, the male space into the women's space and that is why there is always another entry which is the back entry. I'm sure in traditional culture of Chinese and Indian it is similar. Privacy violations in terms of smell is very common because we design the houses in such a way that when you start your car in the morning under the porch, the carbon monoxide would 
flow into the other person's house as well as a person who is uh, uh, lighting a, a joystick for prayer uh, the smoke will again come into another person's house as privacy violation similarly also because of the lack of chimney we are also allowing our cooking smell to go into another person's house sometimes this becomes a or an issue of racial tension now i have touched on the values of multiculturalism and using housing as the example of how that can be converted into architecture if we can solve some of these problems we can have different kinds of corridors different kinds of serambi different kinds of chimney different kinds of uh, ways to handle the windows in the back area we can have a different kind of identity next we come to the values of democracy in which the constitution is a thing that is uh, being respected by all people regardless of their race and religion it gives the the understanding that all the citizens are guaranteed of their dignity and they are in fact the the owners of the country and they will be able to form their own laws through the elected representative once the laws have been created uh, from uh, the people through their representative um, everyone will be held accountable by choice and so um, the days of feudal um, rule in which the king or sultan can do whatever they want is over uh, we have the rule of law and someone cannot be above the law no one even the prime minister and in to some sense even the royalty now even people like dr ahmad farooq musa when he talks about islam he talks about islam in terms of uh, commitment to democracy and uh, importance of citizenry regardless of race religion gender class and ethnicity um, muslims and non muslims are citizens of a pluralistic society where we live together as neighbors this is the strength in constitution however sometimes or uh, right now there are people who seem overly religious and they say that religion transcend the constitution and this is going to be a big problem uh, if we accept this treatise we cannot have one group of people saying that they are above the constitution and this will become or make the constitution null and void or uh, toothless so farooq musa believes that islam uh, is not above the constitution because it focuses on the civil state such as justice freedom of conscience freedom of expression good governance separation of power rule of law respect for human rights and economic equality these are the values of islam but unfortunately some other religious scholars again uh, who do not understand the modern state and the idea of constitute constitution and use the the old books of religion to govern the minds of the people and poison them in terms of this idea that um, islam is somehow above everything and therefore they don't have to follow whatever idea of rule of law or respect for human rights human rights is always being criticized as very un-islamic Now I will talk about three values of democracy and how they should be interpreted in architecture. Now leadership that is representative, accountable and accessible or people friendly are the cornerstones of democracy. How can this be shown in architecture of administration? Now, first of all representative of leadership or rep leadership by representation meaning that it represents all types of people whatever religion whatever race uh, gets to have a chance to make laws uh, that everyone in the country can can live by and any issues there will be consultation and this is called parliament where 
we consult each other and come to a decision. Now, if it was representative, then we can see that the Putrajaya Perdana Putra is not representative because it represents a single ethnic image. The Dewan Jubilee in Tan is eclectic. It combines Chinese, Indian and Malay architecture. So, in that sense, it's representative. The parliament building doesn't have any ethnic reference at all. So, it is not representative of any ethnic Therefore, it is considered to be a democratic building. Both the Dewan Jubilee Intan and the Parliament building are spirit of democracy, not the Perdana Putra uh, in Putrajaya. Accountable leadership is about responsible management and the idea of transparency. We must be able to see that the government is not a corrupt or the machinery or the representative are not involved in corrupt uh, dealings and, and, and the money and the responsibility of uh, the nation lies with the accountability of these people. Now, I read accountability in architecture as having um, an architecture that is not wasteful. If we look at the Padana Putra again, it looks like an architecture that does not have any sun shading device at all. Why is that happening? What, why, why do we allow such things? Without sun shading device, the cooling load will be much higher. And look at the parliament building. It has this uh, uh, sun shading device as well as the Masjid Negara. So these two buildings of parliament and Masjid Negara are building with accountability about the way that the uh, civil servant and the elected representative spend the money of the rakyat. We see also that the parliament building does not have much embellishment in terms of ornamentation. Even if it does have embellishment, it is a functional ornament like the sun shading device. In the Putrajaya, it has ornament that has no function of sun shading device or any structure or anything at all. And therefore, they are just ornament by themselves, especially the dome. Why must there be a dome when other... Uh, simple cheap roof can be made accessibility is about how the rakyat feels that they can actually go to see their parliamentarians their prime minister their ministers at ease and so uh, the architecture interpretation from that is about how it is not imposing how it is more uh, of an organic or natural setting like what Frank Lord I say at ease and uh, that it does not have too much of a setback um, in terms of its up. If you look at the Padana Putra building, it has a, a setback that is very far and so this shows the separation between the people and the leaders. Some say that this is necessary for security. I don't think so because in the parliament building of uh, Great Britain, there is no fence. The setback from the street is only about 10 to 20 feet, whereas the setback from the street of Padana Putra is many hundreds of feet. This shows that the parliament building uh, is explaining that they have parliamentarians who are part of the people, they are part of society. Whereas the Padana Putra shows a prime minister that is isolated from people like a king or an emperor when in fact he is the servant to the people. So this setback is a bad idea for democracy. Again, if we look at the Istana Iskandria, it has no transparency because it is a king's place. A king is different than an ordinary peasant, peasant like us or the rakyat. They have different rules. But certainly, the Prime Minister should not have different rules. And transparency is shown clearly in the Rishtak building by Norman Foster, where he created a dome on top of the roof of a building, and people can come up to the dome and view the parliamentarians debating from the dome 
and that shows the power of the people and transparency where you could see directly how or what the people are doing. Similarly with the architecture thesis at the bottom where the rakyat can see who is working and doing what in an office. This is a picture of the Rishtak where the people will enter to the roof, uh, through the roof or the top of the roof and into the dome, the glass dome. And here they will see another inner dome which overlooks into the uh, state assembly uh, where they can see who is absent, who is speaking, who is doing the work. And, and this is clearly the most powerful expression of power to the people and uh, the rakyat or the citizen. In terms of the site planning, uh, the Putrajaya uh, planning uses strong axis like the monumental architecture, say the Taj Mahal or other uh, imperial architecture. This is not uh, encouraging democracy. This is giving the impression of a powerful and uh, isolated monarch. Uh, as opposed to the Kota Darul Naim, um, the State Assembly of uh, Kelantan, it is low scale and it has no strong axis, therefore a bit more friendly in terms of the image that it portrays rather than the ones in Putrajaya. Frank Lord Wright in the creation of his Broadacre city makes a clear political statement that the power is with the people to the point that we can't even see which in this broad eco city is the administrative center. The administrative center blends in totally with the city to show that they are not powerful. And, and this is a clear uh, statement of democratic architecture by Frank Lord. The Sinatsalo town hall in Finland uh, looks like a building that is friendly because it doesn't have symmetry, monumentality, the material is cheap because um, it is of brick, like any other building, and it is designed in a manner in which people can easily walk into and have a square in the middle for certain small peaceful demonstrations or gathering and make it very accessible for people to come in. There are no gates, there are no setbacks, they are just something that you can come in, uh, look at the, the way that we, we design our municipal architecture or municipal authority. Very monumental, very castle-like, fences, setbacks, doors and doors, guards, security guards. Uh, that, that is not democracy. And so this is the idea of uh, what true democracy means. Right in his Marine County Civic Center is an architecture that is more uh, asymmetrical, informal, relaxed, non-axial, and uh, it does not command the landscape. The landscape overwhelms the whole building. Unfortunately, Wright is given only one project uh, for him to explain the idea of democracy. And uh, certainly this idea of democracy in architecture uh, is different than the ones in Putrajaya, where it looks like a palace rather than a building that um, is part and parcel of the site and uh, also of inviting people to be at ease with it. Thus, we have the idea of representative architecture, accountable architecture and accessible architecture that becomes the character uh, of the country if we understand it and therefore, when we look at or design administrative building, we need to take these values of democracy into consideration and manufacture or turn it into architecture forms, siting, as well as uh, features. So, some of these characters of the building that has been successful in terms of dealing with the climate to show um, that is this part of the tropical architecture and also an architecture that is uh, accountable, an architecture that is mixed, 
uh, multiculturalism is are those that can present some ideas for our new architecture and some architecture that I have found for instance in the uh, uh, rest and recreation area uh, in Macha um, using so-called Malay architecture but in very modern way very functional way very tropical way um, perhaps the administrative building and institutional architecture can take lessons from such building uh, that is here in Macha. Uh, I prefer a building uh, that is broken up, not massive, because that is a sign of tropical architecture, a building that is friendly, without a fence, without setback, that can encourage people to come in, and rather than using some foreign architecture uh, to actually falsify the image that we have for our name. So in conclusion, this is the form of architecture that can be derived from the values of democracy and multiculturalism. But again, as I emphasize, do not stick to the form, but understand the values in order to generate other forms, because form is dynamic. It is not uh, constant. The, the wrong approach is to, to, to latch onto a form. That should not be the way. So I end by this cryptic and meaningful statement by Wright about a democratic building being at ease, belong to the people, human scale, and feeling at home. And, and if we can understand such values, we can certainly be able to design a building that is uh, more meaningful to us and we can call it architecture for Malaysia or Malaysian architecture.